Uh, as I have said many times, uh, I'm kind of into sports. I've kept up with sports since I was a little kid, throwing ball against our front steps. And, uh, this sports story kind of went right along with uh, the way my lesson or sermon, whatever you want to call it, is going to go. But some of y'all may remember uh, a boxing match from a few years back. Mike Tyson against Buster Douglas on February 11th of 1990 in Tokyo, Japan. It is to be called one of the greatest upsets in sports history. Tyson was the undefeated, undisputed heavyweight boxing champion of the world. He was the world's top heavyweight and also the number one fighter pound for pound, as many boxing magazines and Promoters considered him. Buster Douglas was ranked number seven in the world, pretty much unheard of. With the mix of professional boxing success, he found his way with a title shot against Mike Tyson in Tokyo, Japan on February 11th of 1990. 23 days prior to this title fight, Douglas's mother, Lula, Lula Pearl, passed away. The mother of his son, at this same time, was facing a serious kidney ailment. And the day before the fight, he caught the flu. Some people might say that the odds was against him from the start, going up against remarkably one of the greatest fighters that boxing has ever seen. And to top all that, you lose your mother a few days before that. I don't want to imagine what that's like, but I imagine it was tough. See, the mother of your child battling bad ailment. Not only that, to catch the flu the day before. But Douglas made his way into the ring. Defeated Tyson in the 10th round to become the new world's champion. With all the setbacks, he went ahead. And this is kind of where my title is going to come from. He went into that ring of nobody and left the world's champion. And going to lead me to the title of my message, which is, it doesn't matter how you come in, it matters how you leave. If you'll stand with me, I'm going to read the word now. Luke chapter 13, we'll start with verse 10, read through 13. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity eighteen years, and was bowed together, and could in no wise lift her up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him, and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and glorified God. If you will, with me pray before we get into this that the Lord have his hand on this tonight if you will. Dear Lord we come to you tonight we ask you that you will bless us as the word as it goes forth. Bless me as I bring it forth. Open the ears to hear it and the hearts to receive it Lord so we can draw closer to you and leave here better than what we come in. We ask you this tonight in Jesus name we pray Amen. Most of us have heard this story of this woman. But just to kind of give you a little bit about it, or what I kind of wrote down, this woman went to church. Now you and all, I, we all know she had every right. She could have stayed at home. 
I couldn't imagine. I mean, you just think about her bent down. That's how I picture it. She couldn't lift herself up. You know, who wouldn't want to stay home? She had every excuse to. More than likely, back in those days, they had to walk. We don't know how far she had to walk, but I'm very certain she had to walk to get to the church or somebody help her there. Uh, So she could have very easily stayed at the house. She had battled this for 18 years. And we sit here and think, man. And the first, the, the Lord, as soon as I read that and started writing this down, it just crossed my mind. I have problems if the Lord hadn't took care of something for me in 18 hours, much less 18 years. You know, we, we get kind of impatient sometimes. But then the, the next thing is, when Jesus called her, she went to him. Because it, it, it states in the scripture, he called her to him, and then he laid his hands on her. So that tells me, when he called, she listened. She moved to him. She listened to what he was telling her. This lady come in that day. Just like, and I have every, I I looked up some stuff and I couldn't find nothing definite, so I can't tell you with 100% certainty. But I believe with all my heart, this lady was a regular church attendant. I read several things and and they all pointed to that. Different uh, Bible scholars, if you will, was they, they all agreed to that. This woman was more than likely a church attendee. This was something she done on a regular basis. So, she come in that day just like she had we don't know how many times before. Oh, but when she left, she left touched by the Master, able to straighten up, loosed from her infirmity. That's all we got to do sometimes is get here, drag ourselves here. That's all he asks us to do. If we'll get here, he'll take care of the rest. I know that it's hard a lot of times. I know that. Uh, it's, it's hard to, to make our way uh, after a long day, a hard day. Uh, but we, we got to make it a point to get here. And not only that, when we get here, to see that we're going to be different than when we left. And I'll get into that a little bit more in just a minute. God is in the life-changing business. I know that for a fact. You can come through these doors broken in a million pieces. Feeling like your life could never be put back together again. I've been there. Not, you know, we we all pretty well know each other. I know other people in here that's been in the same boat. Your life has been in shambles, but you find your way back here. He made us. He can put us back together. He knows everything about us. But just one touch from the Master's hand, and you can leave here a lot different than what you came. And I got a few scriptures to back that up. I'm not going to read all of them. I'll just call them out. The woman with infirmity that we just read from our text in Luke 13. Peter's mother-in-law in in Matthew 8, 14 and 15. The leper in Matthew 8, 2 and 3. That's all it took was one touch. Jairus' daughter in Luke 8. And I'm going to read some of these because this this story kind of resonates with us around here these days. Because just not to get too far off, but watching Sister Barker race from the dead was something that I don't know. I can't speak for the rest of y'all, but that I knew. I knew God could do anything, but when He done that, and I witnessed it with my own two eyes, there ain't a doubt in my mind anymore about anything. 
That's when I started believing that day. You got everything, Lord. It's yours. I ain't got nothing. Nothing that you can't handle. So in verse 49, it says, While he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the masters. If you go back a few verses, they was trying to get to Jesus. She was just sick. But in the meantime, she's passed away. Verse 50 says, But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in save Peter and James and John and the father and the mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her, but he said, Weep not, she is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And I'll stop there for a minute. How many of us, I can't say I wouldn't have done the same thing. You know, because I was sitting over there that day, and I was had it in my mind. I said, you know, this is a bad deal. The first time we ever have a Labor Day picnic, and this is going to hang over it. That's what was in my mind. But see, he had different plans. You know, so I can't, I can't condemn these people for laughing him to scorn. I was feeling the same way for myself. I'm just human. And he pulled them out. He, and he pulled them all out and took her by the hand and called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit come again, and she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her meat. That's all it takes is one touch. How many times, I know it's happened to me and others, but how many times have we been down, discouraged, whatever it may be, and we get just a touch? It, it may be at your house listening to a song and the Holy Ghost get on you. It could be here. There's nothing that says that you got to be here for it to happen. But how many of us have just had that touch sometime? And, and you're not, I mean, over a period of time, you're not going to remember every one, but there's some that stick out. You remember there was a time that God touched me. And the situation I was in was bad. But when I come out of it, I was a lot better not only that, you build on the faith on that, saying, well, he's done this before. Well, now I know he can do it again. And, and the next battle, you fight, it's a little bit easier. Because you have to live sometimes off of the past, what has happened for you in the past. And I know we like to put the past behind us, and I'm all for that. But some things from the past, we have to draw power upon and draw strength upon. Try not to chase too many rabbits tonight. So. And I'm under strict orders to keep it short. <laughs> I'll probably have my plate broke if it's over 30 minutes or something. <laughs> We've all heard of the term life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well-known phrases in the United States Declaration of Independence. The phrase gives three examples of unalienable rights in which the Declaration says has been given to all beings by their Creator and for which governments are created to protect. And they was right. Those three things did get gave to us by our creator you may feel as though you have no life no liberty because you are bound with things and that happiness is something that you will never have 
I can tell you how to get these things. It's in a relationship with Jesus. Life. John 10 and 10 says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. That's Jesus speaking. He's the life. So that's where we get our life. Liberty. John 8 and 36. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Jesus speaking again. 2 Corinthians 3 and 17. Now the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The pursuit of happiness. Well, to break this down a little bit, if we're going to have true happiness, it ain't going to come but from one place. And that's from up there. So we're going to have to pursue Him. The first thing is, and I didn't write this down, but I believe it's Brother Pete's favorite scripture. Seek you first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. That's talking about a little happiness. There's a little happiness in there. You put Him first and seek Him, you'll be happy. But for some scriptures on, on and, and they're, they're based on joy. Romans 15 and 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Romans 14 and 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's where our joy is at. It's in the Holy Ghost. You know, you, you, get, you get full of the Holy Ghost, you ain't never been happy like you've been happy. Huh? I ain't, I ain't lying to you. I ain't going to stand up here and lie to you. I ain't that brave. <laughs> I might fib to you a little bit outside, but I ain't going to do it in here. <laughs> I'm just teasing. <laughs> if we're going to have a life full of if we're going to have a life full of life, liberty, and happiness, we're going to have to get full of the Holy Ghost. There ain't no way around it. There ain't no if, ands, or buts about it. That's the only way it's going to happen. And I know this. I try to find happiness in everything under the sun. It does not work. You can take that to the bank. It does not work. Calm down for a minute. Now, you might think, because I, I know there's a lot of us in here been had the Holy Ghost for about 300 years, but you might think that, and I'm just teasing, so nobody takes that to heart. i got to try to joke to keep my nerves down. But <laughs> we might look at this message and think that that's strictly for somebody who don't know the Lord, but it's not. Every one of us, every one of us, when we walk through these doors, God has something for us. I don't care if you've been here a hundred years or five years. When we come through them doors to have church, he's got something for you. The next thing about that, you know what the next thing is, Sister Rita? I know you won't get mad at me. It's up to us to get it. I just ain't going to come up here and plop my behind down and get it. I got to put some effort. I got to put a little go ahead. I got to praise him a little bit, worship him a little bit, even though I might not feel like it sometimes. In order to get what I got to get, or what I need to get, I have to put forth the effort to get it. Amen. You know, it's free. We know it's free. It don't cost nothing. But we got to get the effort to get it. That's the only thing it really costs is a little bit of effort. It may be a struggle to get it, but we've got to fight for it. We've got to get it up here, down in our heart. When we come here, we're getting what God has got for us. I'm getting what I need tonight. And when I talk about that, I start thinking about the woman with the issue of blood. She fought. If you read the scripture, she fought through the crowd. 
you can just imagine a crowd of people thronging Jesus. And she fought through the crowd to get to him. You know what that tells me? She made up her mind. I'm tired of living the way I'm living. I know where the answer is. I know where to get it. And there ain't nobody or nothing going to stand in my way. I'm fighting through everything here and I'm going to get what I need to get. You may think you've been too bad or failed too many times before. Wrong. That's a lie from the pits of hell. The devil will play on you as long as you will let him. Paul said in Romans 3 and 23 that for all have sinned and came short of the glory of God. And to an old wretched sinner like I was, that was good news to know. Because I don't feel like that there was anybody that failed the Lord as much as I did. I will expound on that a little bit later. 1 John 1 and 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, Sister Leanne, I know you won't get mad either. But the old devil tries to tell me you know, Sister Leanne knows how you used to be. She knows what you used to do. Your sister knows what you used to do. But you know what the Bible tells me? That if, if I come to him sincere in heart with my sins, he's faithful to forgive them. And, the, and elsewhere in the scripture it says he cast them as far as the east is from the west. And I really... Basically what that's saying, that's infinity. Because I don't know where the east starts, where it ends, or where the west starts, or where it begins. They're gone. He's forgot about them. When you get them under the blood, they're gone. Do not let the devil keep playing that junk with you. Because trust me, he knows what he's doing. He ain't no dummy. Now I will say, we give him a lot more credit sometimes than what he deserves. But he's smart. Because just like that, he don't have to plant but a little bit of seed. He'll go on. And we'll let that rascal grow. I, I mean, I know I do. He'll put some little ignorant something in my mind, and before the day is over with, I'm tore up. And you can ask my wife. I'll come home from work tore up about stuff, and it, it ain't nothing. But when I got up that morning, the devil put a little seed there, and he just walked away. So I'm done. I'll let this crazy joke take care of himself. <laughs> I'm just being honest with you. We're our own worst enemy a lot of times. And sometimes I think the Lord's looking at us like, why? <laughs> why? You know? I mean, he's probably looking at this and saying, look, you, look down here. Look at this. You see this? After all I've done for him, and he's worrying about this little thing right here. Try to put that paper up, and I wasn't even done. <coughs> Let me call y'all two out over. <laughs> Another thing you might say, or I've said many times, I'm sure others have also. Well, you don't know what I've been going through. You don't know what kind of pain and scars I have. You're 100% right. I don't. I ain't got a clue. But I know a fellow that can fix you. Ain't no doubt about it. Mark 5, see the story of Legion, and this is another one of them stories that just kind of it intrigues me. And it says, And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. The devil had a hold of him. 
who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broke in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. And I want to talk about this story for just a little bit. You have to imagine the man, I, I can't even hardly fathom it. Tormented with the devil. That I can picture him. A couple other places in the Bible it says he was naked. Sit naked. Just imagine taking rocks or what have you, dragging them, cutting, torment. Every day, try to bind him with chains, break him, possessed to what most of us could probably never imagine being possessed. Miserable life. But you know, that's kind of some of what the pain that people feel, that their life is torn. They feel that cutting. It's like you took a knife. And cut. The wounds are real. Scars. No doubt he had scars all over his body from cutting himself. We can't think what it's like for me to wrap Brother Mark up with some chains and him go pow. And they're gone. We see the Scripture, you'll have to forgive me, I'm not denying the Scripture, but you'll see where I'm going. It says he couldn't be bound, but we know he really was bound. The devil had him bound. May not have been physical, they couldn't keep the chains on him, but he was bound. I know people right now that I've watched their life spiral out of control. The devil has got there. People that I never thought would do things that they've done. They've done. But it don't have to be all gloom and despair. Because there's one thing we can take from this. As I said, but when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. If you read on, Jesus tells the spirits to come out of the man, and they suffered him to go into the swine feeding on the hill. And no doubt, if you read on in the scriptures, no doubt there was people that come to see this man every day. I could just imagine Brother David come by and say, come on, Brother John, let's go. I want to show you something. People knew him. They knew what he said up there and done. Because it says, and they come to see Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the, and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. I mean, I don't know if you could blame them or not. 
they knew what this fella had done on a daily basis. And to see him sitting clothed in his right mind. Uh, but later on it, it says that Jesus tells him to go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done. That's what he can do. See, when, when we dig ourselves down in that wretched place that we're tormented every day with stuff just as this man was, we separate ourselves from our family friend, people that love us, the Lord up above, ultimately. But when he touches us, when we give up and he touches us, you can start getting them back. I know I was a heathen, but I'm proud to say I got a better relationship with my family than I've had ever since I've been coming back to church. It's the truth. When I let God take over my life, everything else is Right into place. And how I know that he can fix any of us, because if he can fix this crazy cat right here that sit out there and cut himself every day and you couldn't keep chains on, plus he can raise the dead, to me there ain't a whole lot left, Sister Leanne. You got a crazy fellow on one end and a dead one on the other. I'm talking about Lazarus, Jairus' daughter, Sister Barker, as we know, we seen. But you got, you see where I'm going. You got a crazy fellow over here and somebody that's passed away. That's like the tail of the tape on two sides. That's about as far as you can go to either way. And I, I'm glad you brought that up because I'm going to tell you a story, another story. I'm good at telling stories, or I think I am anyway. Uh, some of y'all might disagree. Some of you might agree, but uh, I got the mic for right now. So, <laughs> But I believe you're 100% right, Brother David. There ain't no doubt because we don't just all of a sudden wake up tomorrow and find ourselves sitting in a bad place like that. Uh, it does happen over time. Uh, miss a church service. Miss that when it gets a little easier to miss the next one. And I'm not trying to pastor. I'm just telling you, from my own personal experience, I done been there. I can tell you for a fact, you miss tonight, you'll start trying to miss Sunday. You miss Sunday and you think, well... And I'm tired on Sunday night, you know, I'm tired. Uh, I didn't go this morning, might as well not go tonight. And before you know it, you ain't been in two months. I've been there. The first step, the first step of coming through these doors and leaving different than what you came in is being willing. We have got to be willing to do that. Oh. God ain't going to make us do anything. It is a choice we will make. He's not going to do it. It's not the business he's in. 
He, 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 if you go to him, he'll take care of you. But he ain't going to make you. You have to do it. on. You have to decide to do it yourself. He's not going to make anybody serve him. Uh, if we choose to leave this place different than what we came in, he's going to be right there alongside of us, helping us to do that. And I picked up a couple of scriptures out of a couple older Pentecostal heralds. And I don't know how I missed this section in there, but I didn't recognize it. It's called Wisdom from the Pulpit. It's a compilation of quotes that different pastors and stuff have made. Uh, but I thought a couple of them was kind of fitting for this tonight. and uh, One of them by uh, Tim Gaddy says, An altar is a place where God and life collide. You see, life is what happens to us out there on a day-to-day -day basis. There ain't nothing. It happens to every one of us. It ain't no respecter of persons. Things in life happen to everybody. But when we walk through them back doors back there and come through these middle ones, and your altar can be right there, it could be back there, it could be at your house for that matter. But when you begin to pray to the Lord about stuff going on in your life, Lord, it's yours. They collide, and I can tell you which one wins. It's going to be God every time. Things may not always work out how we think that they ought to work out, or, but they work out how he wants them to work out, and he knows what he's doing way more than what I know what I'm doing. Lord knows I mess up all kinds of stuff. The next one is by John McDonald. It says, you can doubt it and live without it, or you can believe it and receive it. You can mully grub all day of every day and think well, things ain't going to get no better for me. And you're right. They sure won't. You keep thinking like that, ain't nothing going to get better. But if you believe it, it's yours. All you got to do is receive it. And I firmly believe, as I said earlier, when we come through them doors, he's got something for everybody in this place. If we doubt it, you can hang it up. But if you believe when you come through them doors, Jesus has got something for me tonight, and I'm going to get it, and when I leave out of there, I'm going to be better off than when I went in. And not only that, I'm going to be able to face tomorrow a little bit better because of what I got today. Now, I won't get on that for a minute, and I didn't write that down. And I probably should have. But am I the only one that can't wait for church time to get here? How? Because all hell is coming against you. It's like we have good church on Sunday night. Monday, you better get ready. And if you ain't got nothing on Monday, Tuesday, you for sure better be looking out because it's coming. You're fixing to fight a fight. Well, let's think about something. How much easier would it be if we started getting what we were supposed to get when we come through these doors? How much easier would that fight be on Monday and Tuesday and through the day on Wednesday to get back on Wednesday night? If we filled up, when we was here, we had had a fuel to carry us. I'm as guilty as this as anybody. I start sputtering about Monday afternoon a lot of times. But that's what we got to do. We got to fill up when we're here. You know? Uh, and that was the, so to speak, last little bit of out of the Bible I want to go. But I want to tell you all something. I don't know why. Never really told this as in-depth as what I'm going to tell it. But it would lead you to how I changed that I got one day that I purposed in my mind 
that the next time I stepped foot in this church, I was leaving different than when I come in. <laughs> some of y'all will know some of my story. I was at church one night, and I can't remember exactly. I, if I'm pretty sure it was a rally here. But I was sitting in the middle row. We used to have middle section here for some of y'all that maybe not know that. Pews over here, pews over there. And I was sitting in the middle row about halfway back. No coincidence that I'm telling this tonight, and the man that's going to be preaching for us Sunday night is the one that's involved in this story. Brother Jeremy Damesworth was preaching. I'll never forget it. I don't even know what he was preaching about. Lord, I'm sorry, but I don't. If I ain't mistaken, I think he had everybody keep sitting. But told everybody to bow their heads, close their eyes. And those of us in the apostolic world, we know what that's all about. We've heard that a lot. If you bow your head, close your eyes, we don't want nobody looking around. That's what was going on this night. And he said, the Lord has laid on me two people that's going to do good work for him. And I'm going to come lay my hands on you. When you do, I want you to stand up. Some of y'all was here. I can still see him right now because I was peeking. You know, some of us peeked. <laughs> I'm just being honest. You know, you don't tell me you ain't done it. Y'all done it too. Looking like you. I hope I don't get caught. But I seen him coming. I closed my eyes. I seen him coming down that aisle, Sister Michelle, and I thought, oh, Lord, I hope he ain't coming to me. I hope he ain't coming to me. You got right there, and you know when somebody stops by, you can hear them, you know. Felt that hand touch me. Well, I got to stand up. <laughs> he touched another person. I could call their name. I won't do it. That's not for me to do. That's when the struggle started. I never did say it was easy before that, but that's when the struggle started. Can't lie, I was terrified. Went on a gradual downhill slope, Brother David was just talking about. And I don't, no coincidence you brought that up either, brother. Many of y'all witnessed this. Try to talk to me. Brother David, my Sunday school teacher that I love dearly. I hold in high regard forever. If y'all only knew some of the stuff he put up with out of some of us honorary boys back there. <laughs> but I walked away with the call of God on my life. And I knew exactly what it was. Because, see, the Lord just don't pop that on you. You kind of start feeling some of that stuff ahead of time. And I kind of been feeling. And that's why I was picking that night. I was pretty sure he was coming right to me. <laughs> but my life got out of control. Party. Laying out all night, keeping my mama up. 
Well, my mama wouldn't sleep till she knew we was home in the bed. There ain't no telling how many years I took off of her life. But you know, every day I seen something that reminded me of this place. See somebody from the church. It was every day deal. Every day I had something remind me of where I was supposed to be. This went on for, Lord, I don't know, several years. I got married, didn't straighten up then. Not to throw my wife under the bus or nothing, but we lived a wild life ourselves even after we was married. Nothing I'm proud of. It's just the way it is, Sister Judy. Some of us have messed up. But you know, I had people praying for me. I knew that. And it's by the grace of God, them people praying for me that God spared me. He didn't have to. He could have called me out at any time, and I'd have been lost as a goose in a hailstorm. I had close encounters. I found my behind floating down the river in a boat one day, barges all around. Nobody would help us. They, they say you wave a white flag and somebody will come help you. Don't believe that. That ain't the truth. I was waving it at people and they were just waving back, hollering. I'm like, hey, I need some help over here, you know. Well, found myself in that situation. Make a long story short about that. God will use folks. He sent a man, it was a man that went to prison for murder. Ain't been out of penitentiary just a couple years. Was coming out from fishing. And I'm, there was a man and woman sitting up on top of the levee, an elderly man and woman. You can ask my mom. They had said they had done, they seen us. They watched us float from here at Morrison Island, going around Hartman's Island down here. We was gone. There ain't nothing you can do. You know, we didn't have a paddle, didn't have a life jacket. We're there. Barges everywhere. They was on both sides of us, coming to us all around. I looked at Scotty. Scotty said, man, well, can you pray? Well, yeah, been, buddy, I've been praying. <laughs> you know, I, I tried to jump out of the boat. We went around that island. He said, man, you can't. You can't. You'll never make it. And I probably wouldn't. Anybody that's been around Hartman's Island down there, there's some bad current through there. And I had about 150 yards to try to swim. He said, Johnny, you'll never make it. And I'm not going to watch you drown like that. But there was a man who had been to prison for murder pulled up. He'd been fishing. And this man and lady, if I'm not mistaken, Mom, didn't, he, didn't they say they had been to the police station? And said, hey, we just watched the boat go around that island. And they said, well, ma'am, we hate to tell you this, but we can't do anything until we have a missing persons report. If we hear somebody, I mean, I... I can understand that because somebody could just go say, hey, we seen a boat float down the river and they go launch five boats in the river and put people's life in danger for no reason. So they need a legitimate, well, she left mad. And when they got back to the boat ramp, this man was taking the boat out. And she said, I don't know if you'll help them or not, but there's two guys floating down a boat and they just went around that island. Barges everywhere. He put his boat back in the water. 
and I never forget seeing that boat coming. And I knew he wasn't coming. First thing I knew, he's coming close enough I can get his attention because he's dead on the line for us. He's either going to run over us or he's going to have to swerve to go around us. And if he does that, I'm jumping in with him. Yeah. Like, <laughs> his boat's moving. Mine ain't. Or mine's moving but going the wrong way, you know. But anyhow, he told us back. And we was at the other boat ramp down here behind the asphalt plant. When we took our boat out of the water, I'll never forget it. We went to pull up on the levee. Now, I've lived here my whole life. 